Thanks, everyone. It's, um, I suppose, you know, I've, I've been doing this for about five years, turning up here and getting people to, to play music. And um, I realise if, it, you know, maybe the moral of what I'm going to tell you is if you uh, hang around long enough, they just chuck you out front. So uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, my name is Richard King. I've uh, always worked for independent record labels. Um, independent record labels. Volatile, exciting, haphazard, often broke, um, regularly deranged kinds of places where, where people make it up as they go along, um, putting out records they like, um, very rarely knowing what they're doing and uh, often celebrating that fact. Um, <laughs> I spent the last uh, three or four years writing a book, a history of independent record labels, um, all those fantastic companies that started in around punk and afterwards and then throughout the 80s and 90s, um, you'll know many of them. I'll talk about a few of them later. Um, people starting labels in their bedroom, in the back of a shop, in a pub, uh, anywhere really. Just the idea of doing what you love, setting up something, not, no not knowing what you're doing and then not knowing when you're making mistakes. Brilliant thing to do. Make it up as you go along. Um, around the 1970s, end of the 1970s, independent music counted for about 5% of the music market. By 1991, it was nearly a third. Um, so obviously the major labels, the major music industry took notice of that and uh, tried to put a stop to it, basically. Um, a lot of people went mad, a lot of people went to rehab, a lot of people ended up very broke and very poor. Uh, most of all, a lot of people had a lot, a lot, a lot of fun and put out music that people liked. Um, but my main motivation for writing the book was um, just have an enormous, almost irrational, um, sleep-depriving problem with the word indie. <laughs> indie, 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 indie. Indie, 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 indie. <laughs> indie. I, don't, I do not know what indie means. Um, I haven't a clue. It used to be an abbreviation for the word independence. Uh, now, uh, I, God knows what it means. I suppose in music, it's usually four white guys kind of strumming away, uh, telling you all their problems, the kind of problems no one else has ever had, just those four. <laughs> <laughs> Just those four white guys. Uh, what I didn't realise was you can actually order an indie pizza. Um, and in Brooklyn, in a, in a catalogue, I once saw someone trying to sell indie real estate. So I don't know what that looks like. But um, I suppose indie cinema, indie rom-coms, they're usually brunette, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> I think indie's quite brunette. Um, <laughs> the female lead will have a fringe. Um, <laughs> The, the male lead will have a satchel. Um, and we're meant to find these people fascinating, I don't know. Um, <laughs> completely beyond me. Um, so, yeah, indie, God. Um, <laughs> indie, indie, indie. Um, let's get back to independent labels. Um, probably most famous in this country in the last, last 30 years is um, Factory Records of Manchester. Um, Many of you know about Factory. If you think about Factory, you probably think about Joy Division, the Blue Order Sleeve for Blue Monday, or this place, the Hacienda, uh, in its Acid House heyday, the club that um, Factory started. And the whole of Manchester now, basically, has bought into the Factory myth. And uh, civil servants, uh, creatives, um, and especially property developers, all tell their story based around factory in Manchester. Um, if you go to this place, the Beetham Tower Hotel, uh, some of it's a hotel, some of it's owned by Hilton, some of it's residential. The Beetham Tower in Manchester, very good, possibly the exemplar of shiny glass and steel, Mancunian aspiration. And uh, on the 23rd floor, in a bar called Cloud 23, Manchester's top night out. You can get pissed on Indy. Um, 
can drink a hand in glove, could drink a step on, Happy Monday song, or you could have a the hass. Uh, that's got margarita in it, so. <laughs> Different kind of feeling to what they were taking the hacienda, I guess. But anyway, while you're, <laughs> while you're schmoozing for your planning permission or, you know, whatever they do up there, you can, you know, drink it in. Um, so, yeah, factory, uh, enormously important in how Manchester sees itself now. Um, but I think, you know, what people forget is this is where factory was run from. Um, first floor flat in uh, Didsbury, sort of crumbly Victorian nothingy place, place that Tony Wilson called a right shithole. And for all but the last year of Factory's life, it never had an office, it was run from here. So the postman would bring cheques for millions of pounds, Factory Records, care of Alan Erasmus, 82 Palatine Road here. This, is, this was the creative industries hub of Manchester right there. Um, the other thing people forget is that Tony Wilson, here he is looking for all the world like an international jet set mover and shaker. Um, he never took a salary from factory. He never paid himself from factory. He always worked for Granada. He was a newsreader. He um, did some other TV presenting, but he wanted to keep the money Factory made for things that Factory would do. So not having an office, not drawing a salary, not getting bogged down in the things that the, in, the mainstream music business does allowed Factory to remain independent. And that's its greatest legacy, legacy I think, is that it always wanted to do something different. Now, it made a lot of mistakes, it did some really stupid things, and it went bust. So whether you think it succeeded or not is what you think about successes, but the fact that it's so popular and it's so crucial now to how a whole city sees itself, I think, think suggests they're doing something very right. Um, another great label, 4AD. Probably know this too, some of you. 4AD is still going today. Now it's a brand. It's a brand for um, a larger record label called Beggar's Banquet. And uh, 4AD was set up by a wonderful man, Ivo Watts Russell back of a record shop. Um, he's no longer anything to do with 4AD. He sold it to, to Beggar's Group. 4AD still does put out some great music. Um, and the first person Ivo hired was a graphic designer. Not a manager, not a lawyer, not an accountant. A graphic designer. He didn't even hire a PR person. Because uh, he, <laughs> he wanted his records to look as good as he thought they sounded. So for three years, it's just the two of them. Ivo did everything, and Vaughan uh, made the sleeves. And here's Ivo. Anyone who's been in a band will be familiar with this kind of dialogue. There's a guy from the record company holding a bottle of beer, pointing at the guy from the band. That's Charles Francis from the Pixies. It looked like they're having a, some degree of negotiation about something there. Um, and then 4AD had a number one with Pump Up the Volume by Mars. Um, big selling record. Uh, first number one for 4AD, first number one for the company that distributed their music. And Ivo said in many ways that was the beginning of the end. Because the last thing he wanted to do was let people think he knew what he was doing. Having a number one, you know, most people start record companies to sell records. And actually, if you are in the music business, it is something you have to do to sort of to actually be in the record business, I suppose. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, never, he, he, didn't, he wasn't interested in number ones. He wasn't interested in that kind of success. He wanted his... He, what he said to me was, I always thought if a record existed, that was a success. And 4AD records were very beautiful things, and that's what he cared about most. But once he had had number ones, people thought, well, we'll have a number one with him then. And then the lawyers, the managers, the accountants all moved in, and he'd had enough of it. So. He lives here now in, uh, in New Mexico with a two or three dogs, strays that he takes in. Uh, a very happy man, someone completely in love with music still. And it was either money or music for Ivo, and music won out. Now, the very, very, very greatest definition of independence, I think, the KLF. Uh, Jimmy Corti, Bill Drummond. Actually, no, that's Bill and that's Jimmy. <laughs> No, it, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can you say about the KLF? Everything is interesting about the KLF. Um, but 
I think one of the most interesting things is there, were, there was, uh, what did I say? Bill and Jimmy. There's their two wives, Cressida and Sally, who um, were very, did a lot on the, on the kind of running, running things side. They had a friend who did press, Mick Hatton, a friend who did radio, and that was it, six people. That was the KLF. And for an 18-month period, they were the biggest selling singles band in Britain. Uh, they were one better than Factory. They didn't have an office. They were based in a house, but it was a squat. So they didn't even have to only pay any rent and where they lived. Uh, they had a kitchen table. Around that kitchen table, the KLF sold nearly two million records. Uh, squat was in Camberwell. Jimmy did a wonderful mural on the side of the wall of the KLF logo, which is a pyramid in a ghetto blaster. And uh, they just made it up as they went along, knocked out the first floor of the building so they could have raves there, recorded music in the basement. And um, Bill said to me the whole time he was in the KLF, there wasn't one day when he wasn't unloading boxes from a van. Did everything themselves. So what happens when you have success like that, when you're a million selling band? Well, you get invited to award shows and you get given awards. And you, the Brit Awards, for those of you who aren't from the UK, the Brit Awards is a kind of um, Oscars for ugly people, I suppose. Um, it's, uh, it's where the music industry, I, they give awards. Um, and anyway, if you sell lots of records, you're going to win an award. You're going to win an award for selling lots of records. And that's what happened to them. Um, but they weren't interested in uh, collecting the award, so they sent a motorcycle courier to collect their Brit. <laughs> So a guy goes up, doesn't bother removing the helmet, <laughs> takes the gong, hang on, goes back, hold that please, gets his dispatch book out of the bag, sign there. <laughs> <laughs> but the KLF did agree to play at the, uh, the Brits. Uh, now, if you think of the Brits now, you think of maybe someone being witty, probably get a comedian to do the presenting. Um, a band, maybe even an indie band, uh, gets up and does a little thing. Uh, maybe someone says a rude word or something, and then, you know, job done. Um, well, this is what the KLF did when they played the Brit Awards. <laughs> they machine gunned the audience. Um, there's Bill. I should say that he was firing blanks, so no one got hurt. Um, and while I, uh, you know, I'm not a violent person and don't like to see the, the arms industry profit from anything, really, I think machine gunning the entire music business is, is a good way of you know, appearing at their, their general award show. Uh, the KLF left the building then, and no one ever saw them again. That was the end. They went out with a bang. <laughs> but uh, as, a, as a definition of independence, I think trying to sort of kill everyone Who's trying to stop you is a pretty, pretty good definition. Um, we've been talking a lot, and I'm sure we'll all talk a lot about you know, things like supermarkets and Tesco and, and you know, what Arthur was saying and how we, can, um, how we can avoid such big organisations dictating what we do and what choices we have and you know, if we have any choices, consumers, you know, how we go about making those decisions. Well, unfortunately, this is the Tesco of music, iTunes. Um, I know it's sort of heresy to say anything bad about Apple, but there we are. <laughs> I think Apple's all right, you know. I think they make some few nice things, but you know, we'll leave it there. Um, but look at this, bloody hell. Indie, 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 indie. <laughs> but what have we got here? Some of this is really good, actually. Uh, I hasten to say this isn't mine, but I won't tell you whose it is. But they're, they're in here somewhere. Um, but look, Arcade Fire are indie rock. They're not just indie, they're indie rock. Uh, I guess that must mean they rock a bit or something. Um, there we are. Oh, Bon Iver's indie rock as well. But Sufjan Stevens is indie. Interesting. But, um, yeah, the, so the point I'm making is genre. Genre is a terrible thing. Genre is basically what shareholders need. And, you know, big major labels who are owned by shareholders need to make money for them and... No one's making any money in the music business at the moment. So what do you do? Well, you find something that's going to go in that right-hand column. And the more stuff is in that right-hand column, the more chance there is of someone buying it. So 
you know, it wasn't always like this, and uh, without being too nostalgic or sentimental, I'll show you some very beautiful pictures. This is HMV Oxford Street, um, about 1969, I think. They managed to do something that Apple didn't, which is to sell some Beatles records. Um, <laughs> 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 Um, a beautiful place, really, really amazing place. Um, here are some people buying records, golly. Um, but look at that, look at that exchange of, of love of vinyl, exchange of passion, going to the one place to do exactly the same thing and share your joy, share your knowledge, maybe meet someone you can start a band with. Uh, just all that energy in one shop. But, you know, this was taken in April. Uh, this is the Academy Annex in Brooklyn, a uh, really good record shop. And this is on a day called Record Store Day, International Independent Record Store Day. Happens every April, and um, every independent record shop in the world, and you know, this happens in Turkey and Estonia, and um, as well as East London, and you know, all the usual places. Uh, is there a record shop in Hackney? There must be, I don't know. Uh, anyway, well, there's that one on Brick Lane, isn't there? Um, Record Store Day is a huge day now. Um, all, lots of artists um, record and make records specifically for Record Store Day. You know, a band like as big as Radiohead will do a single. Um, in fact, you know, I shouldn't give them too much credit because they're full of ideas, those guys. Um, <laughs> but this wasn't one of theirs. Uh, and bands will produce stuff, it'll all go in the shop, and it'll sell out. Regrettably, some of it will end up on eBay, inevitably, but um, Record Store Day. All the independent shops have stock for that day that you can't get anywhere else, and it's the most successful day in the year for record shops. And obviously, it'd be wonderful if, um, if every day was like that, if every day had a shop full of people doing this, but um, we don't live in times like that anymore. Um, before anyone asks me what's going to happen to the music industry, I should say, I have no idea. Um, and I don't know anyone who does. So, But um, fantastic day, Record Store Day. And I think it's just, it's really important that independence generally is, is uh, recognised for what it is. So if you, if you buy groceries in the Turkish, you know, supermarket, that's being independent. If you buy nails and wood from the hardware store, that's being independent. If you... In a place like this where there's no corporate branding, you know, we're all being pretty independent right now. If you go to a festival where you can actually look up and not see mobile phone sponsorship, I'd say you're being quite independent. Um, and it's really important that we recognise uh, the decisions we have. Because um, all, you know, neoliberalism really wants us to do is to have a choice of decisions to make based on genres that they can make very appealing to us through the creativity of marketing and everything, but if all you're doing is just feeding shareholders, you're closing down cultural choice. And uh, it's a very uh, very difficult time for the music industry at the moment. Uh, any, any business that's failing is always a funny place to be. But uh, independent labels are still going, um, doing better than ever, the ones that are left. And, you know, we need to find a word that captures the energy of independence and of people who don't know what they're doing and are happy to take risks and just make it up as they go along and they don't care if they go bust or they go mad, they're just doing it because they love it. And uh, I'm determined to find a new word for that energy and a new word for that space. And when I find it in music, it will have absolutely nothing to do with the word indie. Thank you very much.